Okay. Let's give Carla two minutes to join. I'm checking my audio real quickly. All good? Yes. Everything can hear good. It. Very nice to see you, Niels. Pleasure is all mine, Luca. Uh, I, as I, so I see that Carla is the only one that is missing and I'm sure that she will connect, uh, well, Carla and Jane are, are, are they are connecting, but they, fortunately they are both in the second slot of panelists that we have today. Uh, so I think we can get started and then, uh, as we already are, uh, I, I guess there will be another session after hours, so I think we have to be relatively strict with timing. So uh, I propose uh, we get started. Uh, good morning to everyone. Uh, as many of you already know, my name is Luca Belli. I'm a professor here at FGV Law School, where I coordinate the, the Center for Technology and Society at FGV. And together with uh, many of the friends that are here today, I was one of the co-founders of this uh, IGF Dynamic Coalition on community connectivity. Uh, the uh, goal of today's session is to discuss community networks as human rights enablers. We have also prepared a uh, brief report discussing these issues with uh, some of you, many of, of the people that are panelists today were co-authors of this report that we will release in a couple of minutes. We will share the, the link is already on the IGF website and so we will share it uh, in a couple of minutes in the chat and uh, before we start and before I give the floor to uh, my colleague Senka Hasic who will co-moderate uh, with me uh, I would like well first to of course thank our distinguished panelists of today uh, we have each of you has quite large uh, biographies and so I will let you introduce you with the se several hats you have just to quickly run through the stellar panel we have today. We will start with some introductory remarks from Ronaldo Neves de Moura uh, who works at the ANATEL, the Brazilian Telecom Regulator. Then we will have Raquel Henno from Article 19, then Nicolas Echanitz from Antarta Mundi, Sabani Balur that works both at APC and the IIT Mumbai uh, Institute, and then Glenn McKnight from IEEE, Nielsen Over from the University of Amsterdam, and also a visiting professor here at FGV Law School, and Carla Peldencio from Exomatica, and Jane, last but of course not least, Jane Coffin from Connect Humanity. Uh, so before uh, get, giving the, the, the passing the mic to, to Senka and then to Ronaldo, I was I just wanted to spend a couple of uh, minutes to introduce the debate so that everyone, uh, both those that are on site on, or that are, are following us online or that will see the recording, understand uh, a little bit the framing of today's session. What is our work? Uh, of course, we are here to discuss community connectivity and especially community networks, which are, as everyone already know here, bottom-up uh, uh, networks uh, crowdsourced by the local communities that uh, build, uh, manage uh, and develop these uh, networks. And these local communities can be NGOs, can be inhabitants of a specific neighborhood, could be uh, public administrations, could be small businesses, and usually are multi-stakeholder participation, cooperations and, and, and partnerships amongst these uh, various actors. And uh, over the past years, we have issued several reports and we have dedicated a lot of sessions since 2016 to the various dimensions of community connectivity, be it technical dimensions, policy dimensions, governance dimension, sustainability dimensions last year. And so uh, how to discuss how these uh, kind of uh, alternative and complementary connectivity strategy can positively contribute to also to achieve the UN Sustainable Development Goals as we are within a UN, the framework of a UN uh, uh, summit here at the IGF. Now, the, uh, we have discussed all these dimensions and we have always uh, somehow link this to human rights debate. But today and this year, we really wanted to 
stress the connections of uh, between community networks and human rights and really the value of community networks as human rights uh, enablers of course these include uh, free freedom of expression access to information free communication which are the most uh, well, well the, the most natural fundamental rights to think about when you speak about ICT infrastructure, but it, there are also other rights and uh, like uh, self-determination. I've been uh, a, a strong advocate of what I call network self-determination. So the capacity of community to jointly uh, build, develop network infrastructure, to use it as a commons, as a common good in order to freely uh, uh, seek, impart and receive uh, information and innovation. So the fact that communities, thanks to the to to this kind of new uh, collective infrastructures, uh, can co-create the internet, as my friend Nicolas Echanis would say, but also they, they they become protagonists of connectivity. They are not anymore uh, in a dynamic of consumer and uh, that buys connectivity and access, but they are in the dynamic of being prosumers. They also produce uh, innovation, produce content, produce co service, produce infrastructure, and they also have control. There is a strong so digital sovereignty dimension on it because they have control over the infrastructure, the services, the data. There is a strong informational self-determination dimension, meaning they have control on the personal data. They are not obliged to trade personal data to access to application has happened in very, in a lot of developing countries at least. I was in a previous session about speaking about net neutrality and internet openness and we discussed a lot of these models that basically oblige poor people to trade personal data to access applications and that is a, something that happens around the world but when we start to understand there are other options, alternative options like community networks, we are not obliged anymore to be in this kind of dynamic. It's not only, it's not a, a dichotomy anymore, but we have more options and indeed very sustainable options. Now, before giving the floor to uh, Ronaldo, I just wanted to uh, pass the mic to uh, my friend and colleague Senka to uh, provide a little bit of introduction of our work uh, and the reports uh, uh, that we are issuing this year. And so please, Senka, the floor is yours. Thanks, Luca. Hi, everyone. My name is Senka Hajic, and I'm a researcher with the Cyberbricks project at the um, Fundação Getulia Vargas. Um, and together with Luca, I coordinate the Dynamic Coalition on Community Connectivity. Um, thank you all for joining. Um, this Dynamic Coalition has started in 2016, and since then, each year, there was some uh, concrete official outcome, mostly in form of um, reports, um, books, uh, manuals, or compilation of papers related to a uh, specific theme. And some of these outcomes have, in fact, been used by policymakers and have really helped to place community networks on, on the map, for example, with regulators, as you will see in some of the presentations later today. And um, this year, we have yet another uh, official outcome, which is a report titled Community Networks as Enablers for Human Rights. Uh, it has been edited by Luca and myself, and uh, we have contributions from nine authors. It is basically a compilation of, um, of papers or chapters, one of which is a collective paper. Uh, it's a direct result of the collaborative effort of the DC3 members. Um, some of the authors are here today. Well. They are all joining online today, and will unpack their contributions. Uh, the The topic we chose this year actually aligns with one of the overall themes of this year's IGF, which is connecting people and safeguarding human rights. Um, and yeah, we have contributions from uh, from civil society, from academia, community networks practitioners, also government representatives. So there are some very different uh, viewpoints and aspects um, on the human on the rights perspective of, um, of community networks. Unfortunately, I do not have any physical copies here with me, but uh, we will share the link later. You can get it from the um, DC3 page of the IGF website. And um, yeah, as I said, some of, the, some of the authors are here with us today. And with that, I will introduce our first speaker, uh, Ronaldo Neves de Moura. Uh, Ronaldo is the head of the International Affairs Office at Anatel, the Brazilian telecommunications regulator. 
and he has worked as regulatory expert since 2009, um, holding several positions in the agency. Uh, Ronaldo researches and writes about telecom policies and regulations, artificial intelligence, uh, the internet, and international affairs related to these themes. And in his talk, Ronaldo will tell us about Anatel's activities related to promotion of community networks, both on a national level, but also when engaging with international bodies such as the ITU. And he will also highlight the relevant synergy between Anatel's activities and the work of the DC3. Welcome, Ronaldo. Thank you, Senka. Thank you, Luca. Uh, good morning, good afternoon, and good evening for the participants worldwide. I'm honored and happy to be on this panel. And uh, many great people will talk after me, and I'll be brief to allow us all to, to hear them. Uh, well, I, I start with a worrying consideration that's not new. Uh, recognizing community networks as a valuable communication tool and as an enabler of human rights is not yet common ground among the countries. It is a long and complex process and the policies and regulatory approach vary a lot. But today I'd like to add a piece of optimism to this uh, consideration. I'd like to point out a good but still ongoing example from Brazil. Well, in Brazil, the last decade corresponds to an expressive emergence of new stakeholders like small and medium enterprises and new models of services provision and network arrangements. And that emergency coincides, provokes, and has been fed back by measures adopted by the National Telecommunication Agency, Anatel, the regulatory body. And it includes a symmetric regulation with fewer obligations imposed on small operators and the imposition of the big operators with significant market power to offer their network resources on an equal and transparent basis to the small and medium stakeholders. And this course of regulatory actions is derived from the recognition that different models and stakeholders should be fostered to bridge the digital gap and promote better connectivity. Among them, the community networks model. This was clear when in September 2020, Anatel and the Embassy of the United Kingdom in Brazil signed the Memorandum of Understanding concerning digital access development in which one of the objectives was support expansion and improvement of community networks uh, as an access uh, to support development of vulnerable populations inter alia. This was the starting point of a specific joint from Anatel's technical staff and the Association for Progressive Communication, APC. And it's worth highlighting that besides research and interviews with many stakeholders, the parts built their outcomes upon the work produced by the Dynamic Coalition on Community Connectivity, DC3 especially in the Community Network Manual, how to build the internet yourself. And taking the manual's premises into account, the MOU outcomes intended to point concrete paths to achieve such new infrastructures, governance and business opportunities in Brazil. And it reveals a synergy and a line of continuity between DC3's manual and Anatel's first results. The main outcomes delivered by APC to Anatel in December 2021 were um, a policy brief, English and Portuguese version, consisting of a comprehensive analysis of the current scenario of community networks in Brazil, including a set of specific recommendations for the agenda improvements. And a community networks manual enrolling recommendations to those interested in implementing these networks in Brazil. It's followed by audiovisual uh, guides. And firstly, apart from disseminating information to the public, Anatel officially sent the recommendations to other governmental bodies 
responsible for addressing part of them, like the Minister of Communications. Subsequently, the agency started an ongoing internal verification and analysis of the recommendations under its competencies. The premise adopted is that the current regime, which disciplines community networks under rules of limited private service as a non-commercial model, should be retained. However, another set of regulatory rules and actions should evolve to promote those networks. There are indications of current regulatory reviews regarding spectrum use, competition, and even general rules for services. It is important to note that after that, Anatel endorsed the conclusion that community network projects are eligible to be funded by financial resources from the Brazilian Universal Fund for Telecommunication Services, FUSH. Furthermore, it pointed out that the fund's current framework includes programs developed by cooperatives and civil society organizations. It should include. This understanding is significant because the agency is a member of the FUSH's managing board and has diverse competencies related to the selection and monitoring of the projects. Well, there were also steps toward an international level of promotion of community networks. That's my last topic, because it's worth noting that the recent Brazilian agenda to the International Telecommunication Union, the United Nations Specialized Agency, for ICTs included community networks once the organization's supreme organ, the Conference of Plenipotentiary, convened in 2022 in Bucharest, Romania. The outcomes of the conference correspond to the high-level framework that should guide the organization's activities in the following years and bring recommendations to its member states and sector members. Among the Brazilian propositions submitted to the PP22, the one related to ITU Resolution 139 addressed the team under an original definition of complementary access networks and solutions. And the main objectives were to emphasize ITU's role in encouraging different business and regulatory models and to establish the role of ITU's members in creating an enabling environment. It's possible to summarize this initiative as an unprecedented effort to include community networks and other emerging models at the center of ITU strategies to bridge the digital gap while stimulating governments and other stakeholders to take them into account. During the, the conference, any advance to modify current ITU resolution depends mainly upon consensus by all member states, all present member states, and therefore proposals are usually adjusted or vetoed during a series of negotiations as a result of the divergences of perspectives of the different countries and regions. In the case of this resolution, IT resolution 139, the version that emerged from the PP22 is not far apart from the Brazilian proposal, being, however, distinct in some of the language and the scope. There is direct instruction to the director of the ITU Development Bureau to support sharing national experiences and information, including telecommunications slash ICTs, complementary access networks and solutions. Regarding the member states, they are now invited to consider facilitating an environment for sharing national experiences for bridging the digital divide, including telecommunications slash ICTs, complementary access networks and solutions, according to national regulations. In this way, uh, new approaches of networks deployment and management became part of an instrument central to the international regime of expanding connectivity and they may be at least necessarily considered in certain ITU development activities. It became a topic to be reflected upon by different countries as well. Considering that the inclusion of emerging teams in ITU resolutions is historically long and complex process, it is reasonable to consider 
that in this case, the team gained momentum and might be further developed in the following years. And still being optimistic regarding the Brazilian case, an evolution to the next phase might go through public policies and regulation improvement on different grounds and advances related to funding projects, particularly from FUST. And at the same time, progresses in the international arena can feedback the Brazilian efforts in technical and strategic aspects. And to this extent, a coherent alignment of the movements can lead to concrete outcomes available to impact the Brazilian connectivity scenario and the rights of our users. So it was that, that piece of optimism that I said that I wanted to, to bring to our discussions. And now I give back uh, the floor to you, Senka and Luca. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, Ronaldo, for this excellent uh, initial overview. Uh, I think it, there are a couple of points that really deserve to be highlighted. Uh, first is really these very positive developments that we are seeing at the ITU. Uh, and again, uh, this is something appointed we, we were already stressing on Monday during this session on the Internet Commons Forum. The fact that these alternative approaches that are based on a uh, different conception of understanding also a pot the potential of uh, using a, a commons-based approach to uh, shape internet governance and the evolution of the internet is something that maybe it took a lot of time to uh, make visible and those of us who have been working on community networks for the, for the past decade or decades um, have struggled a lot to make them visible and the, the IGF has been an incredible platform for us to, 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 to discuss, to unite, to, to, to create synergies, but also to create uh, very good connections and, and br build bridges with regulators like Anatel, that was uh, the first regulator to use to, to, to use in its own official website one of our outcomes, the, the, the Commission Network Manual, and then to start partnerships to ad also to advocate for it at the international level. And I think one has to be uh, to give credit also to Anatel for this incredible work that has been doing not only at the regional level with the ITU Americas, but at the international level being becoming a strong proponent and advocate also for alternative and complementary strategies, which indeed should be seen as complementary, as a complement to uh, bridge the gaps that other approaches may have uh, left over the past decade. Uh, now, I would like to give the floor to our second speaker, who is uh, Hakeo Henno, uh, from Article 19. She is Digital Program Officer at Article 19. She has been focusing on telecommunication regulation and also uh, human rights and social impact of ICTs over the past 20 years. So she's also one of the co-authors of this year report. So Hakel, please, the floor is yours and thank you very much for being with us today. Thank you, Luca. Thank you very much for the invitation. And yes, I would like to start uh, agreeing with uh, with Luca when he said that Anatel has this leadership on the international level, especially in the ITU. I attend the ITU as um, um, a guest, no, from from Anatel as a member of their delegation. So, and we can see that civil society is not very present there, also because it's not in the interest of member states to just you know have this multi stakeholder. Uh, presence there, and so this uh, already uh, shows the the well the position of championship, no, of Anatel in terms of promoting alternative complementary um, um, access solutions on the international level. Um, my approach is more on the international level. I know that we have people here in this panel with decades of of experience on different grassroots uh, initiatives. So I'm not gonna spend time talking about it. Uh, but one thing that I'd like to, to highlight is part of a research that I've done from, uh, you know, starting in the eighties. 
So I gather some ITU documents from the 80s where they were uh, kind of um, analyzing the, or assessing the situation of the telecommunication worldwide, talking mostly about the telephone. And they already said, it's stated in the, in the report, how um, the developing countries were suffering way more than the developed countries. And this could lead to some humanitarian issues in the future, no? with disasters, uh, and when you have the need for basic emergency communications. And in this same uh, reports, um, a few years later, they knew that just a commercial uh, service, no? just the private service wouldn't be able to solve all these issues because they focus different um, goals, no? they have different natures. So I would like to connect that to the current situation of the internet, but also adding uh, something that the telephone didn't have at the time, which is the capacity to create content. And when we say create content, we also talking about media plurality, no? So instead of the gated guardians of what we have when we access uh, the basic apps um, or zero rated services in a, in a smartphone. No? So although most of the people might not be interested in producing their own media content, we need to understand the relevance of having uh, some groups and some communities producing it no? and the right they have to organize and participate collectively especially when those groups are at odds with uh, the government because you know some countries have minorities that are being challenged but are being chased uh, in many cases with violence and sometimes these groups also don't want to be part of any negotiation with the incumbent telecom groups they are not interested in taking part of um, manifesting or, or organizing themselves using the traditional social media you know, uh, because they are fighting social media because of gender um, issues for example um, ethnical issues language issues so this uh, when we talk about complementary access solutions that's what we're talking about not everyone actually the minority might uh, be interested in producing this content, but we have to take them into consideration. No? And so uh, we already talked about the relevance and I think there are plenty of documents coming from the UN, the UNESCO, um, even the industry, no? GSMA also uh, mapped and show uh, the relevance of being connected. No? Uh, and during the pandemic, then we can even add the right to health no right to study, to look for work or work from home. Uh, I think this is kind of settled. So we know the relevance of, of, of connectivity. What is still um, not solved yet. And as I say, this is not something that we should point to one regulator, one industry, because it's not something that was created in the last years. This is something that is coming from a long time that is, um, in the beginning, the internet was a service that uh, maybe the industry could offer to some. You know, it was almost some exotic, uh, curious things, but um, very fast it changed. And now it is a very important way to communicate, but in both ways, no? uh, not only to receive information, but also to, to share information in different languages. And this is something that uh, when we talk about tech autonomy, when we talk about media plurality, and I think that uh, the next speakers are going to talk about it, uh, it's, it's, it's key, no? So it's not only, even if, if the incumbent telecom companies came and offer internet for free for all, uh, this a model of these products that they would offer might not be the product that these people want at all. So this has to be taken into consideration. Of course, this is not uh, discussing the ITU level because I'm talking to a more content level, but it's, it's important, no? 
and um, we cannot ignore some intrinsic political issue between uh, uh, groups when we talk about inequality. You know? So it's not when we talk about inclusion, sometimes we have the idea that there are people who are excluded and they want to be part of this market, which is not always true. They might be excluded because they want something else. Um, also, uh, um, the, what we have right now, you know, this so, some social media that are more important than others, maybe in five or 10 years, uh, the scenario is gonna be different. That's how the market works. Uh, but it, if we are limited to that, we, we, are, we have a limited understanding of what the internet is and can offer, you no? Know? And, and it's of course, it's expansion, you no? Know? The, uh, the, the infrastructure deployment is expensive. So when, the industry has to do that. When the private sector is responsible for that, uh, the products are massified. No, this is uh, basic math that the industry will make. And sometimes, well, as I say, it's not only a matter of what a regulator can do immediately, but this is part of what happened, for example, based on all the, the trend of privatizing infrastructure that happened in the 90s. And as a regulator right now, you cannot just, you know, change everything and start from scratch. So uh, what uh, Ronaldo showed, the work with APC, the work with APC does also with other countries, I think it's trying to say, okay, what can we do with what we have right now, no? And um, so I think that's, um, another thing that I think other, other uh, panelists will mention is that um, beside this mismatch between understanding the issue as a very relevant issue in terms of human rights uh, enabling, but then the um, solutions are still development and economically based. So this is the first mismatch. But then because of the everything that happened, for example, with the pandemics, we have uh, governments accelerating the digitalization of their service, basic service, service that are in need uh, for people who are already in fragile uh, situation. And these people don't have access or they don't have decent access. So you have this acceleration and these people who were already excluded and they might not, they might with time have less than they used to have like two or three years ago or before the pandemic, no? So basically just to, to uh, wrap up, it's, uh, um, well, what part of the work we're trying to do is uh, to work with governments and this industry and other stakeholders to recognize that the current business model um, are not contributing to meaningful and universal connectivity. And they roll in these plans, they have to be, you know, well measured, you no? Know? And the, and also the, the relevance of recognizing the urgency to achieve universal connectivity to all people, not only consumers and the ones who can pay, you no? Know? So it is important to allow the development of diverse technologies for service providers, then champion uh, one size fits all technological solutions and consider the roles of small community and nonprofit operators in providing this complementary connectivity, especially for rural areas, uh, indigenous people, minorities of all kinds, no? people who uh, do not participate or do not want to participate in the formal economy. So that's my grain of salt. Thank you very much. Thank you, Raquel. Thank you for these insights and our Next speaker actually comes from a grassroots movement. Uh, Nicolas Sechanese is the president of Alter Mundi and has been involved in the community networks movement for over 15 years. Um, he is the project manager of the Libre Router project and uh, Nico will share his thoughts on the right to co-create the internet. Hello, hello everyone. Thanks for having me. Um, just to clarify, I'm not the current president of Altamundi, but uh, yes, I'm uh, one of its founders. Um, one thing thing I I wanted to to talk about is um, 
we are we are used to talking about community networks um, as a complement to mainstream connectivity. Uh, like considering uh, mainstream connectivity is what we want, but we cannot get this everywhere. So we are left with community networks as an alternative. I think that we need to turn this around. Um, the internet um, that we now have, which is mostly under control of this mainstream, mainstream connectivity companies and uh, information silos and, uh, and um, to summarize, a small number of monopolies or oligopolies are in control of what the internet is uh, right now. And I think that uh, community networks should be considered more as a beacon and as a source of inspiration and uh, also should be considered a big scale solution, not a small scale solution. Like um, if we consider the, uh, the amount of people that live in rural areas in the world and the amount of people that live in different uh, settlements that are not usually receiving service from commercial operators, uh, this is roughly half of the world. And so half of the world would benefit from community networks. That's not small scale. And I, I bring this up because um, in, in the, I would say like the important stage of the ITU, uh, we usually hear the voices of government and uh, the industry. And there is uh, very little space for the people, the people itself, and to have community networks represented there. Um, I was listening at the um, Anatel presentation, and there was also uh, from our regulator, from the ENACOM regulator, there, there was also a a presentation regarding community networks in the last ITU summit. Um, and we wrote to our uh, representatives to ask uh, what was the document that you presented? What was the content? And what are the ideas? We want to participate. We want to um, share our knowledge and our work. And we know that as, at a national level, um, our, our movement is considered, and uh, in fact, Argentina uh, is the, as far as I know, is the first country that has created a, a program that, is, uh, that uses money from universal service funds to, um, to fund community network initiatives. And this was mostly due to the work of community networks here in Argentina. Um, but at an international level, I think that uh, it would be very interesting if the regulators would bring with them the community representatives to talk in first person in, in such scenarios. Um, then there's the, another thing I think we, we need to consider is, um, when we talk about uh, how many people is still unconnected, um, we sometimes see people from, from government talking about <clears throat> numbers provided by the mobile connectivity industry. And, and this creates a scenario that is not realistic, that does not really talk about meaningful connectivity. Um, like Renata was saying, if you cannot be a content provider or content creator, you cannot even work from your home um, correctly uh, using only mobile connectivity. Um, mobile connectivity usually is usually limited 
inside people's homes. It's not symmetrical. Uh, it provides zero rating for some services, but then traffic is uh, limited both in quantity and time for using it. So I wouldn't say that mobile connectivity <clears throat> is at all, uh, is meaningful connectivity at all. I actually think that it creates creates a second class digital citizenship that we should avoid. Um, then I think that what we do need is more programs like the Roberto Arias program here in Argentina, funding community networks. But we also need to understand that community networks are not a standard operator. And um, programs designed by, by governments need to understand this. Um, usually programs designed by, by the government are, are designed on a on-demand basis. Like they, they suppose that operators will come to the regulator asking for uh, money for the networks through the programs they create. But community networks are operated by people, by communities, by organizations from, from the civil society that are not um, operators that are part of uh, uh, the standard ecosystem. So for example, uh, right now here in Argentina, we, Altermundi is working with uh, 15 communities from different provinces in the country, helping them um, take the first steps in community connectivity. And uh, this one year program ends with the communities um, presenting projects to be funded by the ENACOM, by the regulator. But none of this, or maybe one of these 15 organizations uh, would have um, done this if it hadn't been um, through the help Altermundi is bringing. And we think that this shouldn't be done by an NGO, like in our case, or I mean, we could work with the government, of course, in setting up such programs, but this, this needs to be done by the hundreds and the thousands of communities, not for 10 or 15, like we are doing now. And we cannot do this unless we work together with, with the government. So I think that uh, after many, many years of working with community networks, bringing them forward, um, making the world understand that we exist, that we are not only an alternative, but a beacon of inspiration. Um, I believe that the next stage has to be related to community networks working together with, uh, with the governments. Um, and that's my, my main take out for this. Thank you very much, Nico, for this uh, very insightful uh, remarks and for sharing the, the experience of Ultramundi that is indeed is uh, one of the best practices we have at the international level uh, and really also explains us that yes of course the first step the first huge barrier we have is to make these kind of experiences visible uh, then we have another huge barrier that we have that is to convince uh, regulators and and other stakeholders that they, these experiences are not a threat, but should be actually uh, facilitated. And then we have another, uh, another final barrier that is uh, try to uh, define, try to work together on how to facilitate this, this uh, experiences in the best possible way. Uh, and it is not all, it does not only comes to uh, funding, which of course is essential, but also how to organize, how to structure properly program that can uh, make this a very uh, viable and also easy to implement alternative. Uh, to have some further comments on this, but switching 
uh, of the continent, we have uh, Sarbani Belur, who is regional coordinator at APC and has been working also a lot, uh, both from an academic perspective and also uh, on the field with community networks over the past years. So please, Sarbani, the floor is yours. And uh, I just wanted, before giving you the, the floor, sorry, Sarbani, to remind all the speakers to please try to stick into, to stick into, sorry, uh, uh, six or seven minutes. And after Sarbani, we will have a brief moment for comments or questions from the participants. So if you either want to uh, leave them in the chat or raise your or uh, leave your name in the chat if you want to speak or uh, if you are on site, tell Sanka that you will want to make a comment uh, right after Sarbani. So Sarbani, please, the floor is yours. Uh, hello, uh, hello, uh, everyone. Thank you for inviting me to be a part of this uh, panel. Um, it's uh, community networks, seeding community networks to grow is uh, a passion of mine. And I'm, I'm being given uh, that um, facilitated by APC. Um, and I am the Asia Regional Coordinator. Um, uh, so the trist that we always have with this connectivity or connecting the unconnected is that the question of perspective of connectivity. Are we trying to connect the unconnected or the con unconnected are trying to connect themselves? So there is this dilemma that is always going on in our minds when we go ahead and connect these unconnected villages or locations in the in in the different uh, parts of our of uh, the globe. Now um, one of the very important things that come up in these discussions is that the telecom operators usually do not go into these uh, remote rural villages uh, because they don't find it as a lucrative business model for themselves. Um, and it is, and in some cases, like in the Indian case, what we see is that the, the fiber, the optical fiber is uh, terminated at the mouth of the village, you know, at the entrance of the village, and it doesn't enter into the village just because there is no business model for the telecom operator. Now, that is, that is again, at that juncture, um, uh, we often have this discussion with the communities that the communities have now given up on internet connectivity. They don't want to have internet connectivity, but they do want to have local mesh networks enabled, which can give them the benefit of all the aspects that they can get in the internet or the online connectivity. And one of the other reasons what they state as one, as, um, as one of the reasons why they want uh, the offline mesh network is that um, they are they being illiterate, not, have, not being digitally savvy. They find it very difficult to place themselves in the digital world. Just suddenly, if you give them connectivity, they find themselves very difficult to uh, be in the digital world because they are uh, they they encounter um, uh, problems with digital privacy security issues and things of that sort so um, so uh, with in uh, with a, along with apc funding we have seeded quite a lot of community networks in the asian context uh, wherein um, uh, we have most of the most of the networks are actually networks that are made um, uh, uh, based on the needs of the community. Like uh, one of the networks, I can give you an example of one of the networks that I seeded to grow in Pathardi, in five, uh, five hours drive from Mumbai. And this uh, community wanted uh, connectivity only at one location for enablement of their services, the government services. So we enabled it through a cellular router, SIM card based cellular router. And the rest of the network is an offline mesh network. We empowered a banking correspondent who enables the banking services for the people in that through that one one point connectivity, online connectivity through the SIP card based cellular router. In another in another uh, community network in India called Servilox, the entire network for five years was an offline mesh network, wherein they explored the option of local service enablement. Um, a community radio is one of one such uh, functionality that they have got in. So uh, you see that the reliance on this internet is slowly becoming, of course, it is very important for the people in these remote villages, more so by the COVID, 
but um, the relevance is slowly now moving towards a right based approach where they say that okay if internet is not there let us at least have an offline mesh network and many of the communities are coming up now with this suggestion that let us have community uh, network which is an offline mesh network where we can we can have our language language repository we can have a local knowledge repository we can have a community radio everything so i think this is what uh, we would like to see in the in the in the distant future that even if there is no connectivity being enabled um, community networks will surely have one form of other or a solution for enabling connectivity in the last time. So I hope I have stuck to my uh, five minutes time. Thank you. All right, so let's see if we have uh, any questions in the chat. I'm scrolling down. Uh, I think that if the, if you have if any of the participants have questions, you, you can uh, include them here. Uh, I uh, think that Adriana Labardini wanted to make uh, to, uh, to provide a comment or a question, and uh, if there is also anyone else on site willing to to provide comments or questions, please reach out to Senka. I, I from here, I unfortunately I cannot see the. Uh, the, the room at the IGF venue, so please reach out to Senka, who has a mic. And now I will give the floor for a quick comments to Adriana Labardini. Thank you, Luca, and congratulations on this very plural, diverse and interesting panel and very relevant uh, for the future of societies and democracies. Um, just one question. Uh, mainly to Mr. Ronaldo Moura in Brazil, but but for for any other uh, uh, frameworks as well. Uh, as we all know, uh, community networks regimes across the global south may have different forms. Not only a different registration requirement or license, but but uh, a different nature. In Mexico, for instance, they are deemed as private networks. They do not have the obligation to interconnect, but they do have the right to interconnect. And certainly one of the main purposes of community networks is to access internet and be able to negotiate a wholesale internet and not retail because otherwise it would be unaffordable. So um, it is, uh, important and I am so happy to hear about this support from Anatel in the future to community networks and access to first resources uh, because operators, com large commercial operators, even with subsidies, often abandon this uh, these projects because the operating expenses of uh, in rural areas is not affordable for them and so even with with universal service funds they drop the the, the connectivity in those areas but um, we understand that there was a rulemaking process consultation 41 in in Anatel that and, and I just want to ask it because uh, we I don't know exactly the scope of it that apparently was intending to limit uh, the possibility of access to internet for SOPs and so if they will no longer be allowed to provide internet access well they would I mean all community networks would die in 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 Brazil and elsewhere. Uh, of, so, so I wanted to ask whether, uh, with this new policy and support for community networks, I understand this consultation would no longer, or this new rule would no longer be uh, uh, enforced or, or, or approved, because I, I cannot understand how an SLP regime could cope with prohibiting an internet access. That, that's all. If there are other uh, in the here in the 
audience and the panel members, other uh, regimes, maybe in Argentina, that um, allow full-fledged in interconnection and full-fledged services for community networks, not only Wi-Fi based, uh, that it would be very interesting to, to hear about those experiences. Thank you. Thank you very much, Adriana, for this. Maybe a quick reply from uh, Ronaldo, and then we can uh, go straight to the next panelist, Glenn. Uh, thank you, Adriana. I think that you, you raised uh, a very a very relevant point and the ongoing discussion. And, and that's why I was saying about how the progress in the international arena can feedback the Brazilian efforts. But internally in Brazil, the two processes, the process of the of building the international proposals, for example, this proposal to resolution 139 uh, and the regulatory process, the process to, to have a new a new regulation, they are not uh, necessarily connected. And so um, it doesn't mean what, what I'm saying, it doesn't mean that uh, after the new resolution 139, the other regulatory process should stop. No, it continues. It's an, it's uh, under discussion. I think that if I'm not wrong, the public consultation is, is still over. And the proposition is, as I understand, is to, to keep the community networks under in these aspects under the regime as the current regime as a non-commercial model and then the slp as you said so they they wouldn't have the advantages for example and in this way i agree with you they wouldn't have the advantages for example of the small and medium operators and that's the debate that uh, that i think that the agency I uh, should consider in in the in this moment, and that's why it's very important to have the a multi stakeholder debate even after the public consultation, and that's that's something tradition in the agency. The agency is usually open even after public consultations to receive more inputs. You you got the point. You got the main point in this discussion. This should be, be considered fully in the regulatory process to have effective rules and not to put under uh, unreasonable limits. Thank you very much, Ronaldo. And indeed, uh, we all know that uh, participation and multi-stakeholderism are embedded within the DNA of Brazilian uh, digital policy making. So we all look uh, forward to the next phases of this uh, participatory process to uh, try maybe even to help and uh, positively impact with uh, uh, best practices this uh, evolving discussion. Now, I would like to give the floor to our next speaker, a good friend, uh, Glenn McKnight from IEEE. Uh, he has been with us uh, for many years and he has been also working a lot with the electrical uh, and engineering parts of, of, of networking. So please, uh, Glenn, uh, the floor is yours to provide your perspective. Great. Thank you, everybody. Um, so did you want me to do my slideshow now? Uh, Luca, oh, yes, or? sure. Yes, sure. Yes. Okay. I, I would all, only um, remind all the panelists to please stick into the six or seven minutes. Thank you very much. Okay. I'm I'm disabled. So I need access to, to share my slides. So I would like to ask the technical assistance to provide to the IGF host to provide uh, access to the uh, to the share screen. Exactly. We are, we are seeing this. Now. Thank you. Okay, great. Thank you. Thank you. And it's so great to see all of you. Uh, I saw Sarbini uh, recently at the APNEC uh, event in Singapore. It was great to see you and your students. Um, this is going to be very quick. Uh, I, I want to give you an overview, particularly of the IEEE Smart Village. This is a project that we started. And in fact, uh, I think I met uh, Adriana back over 10 years ago in Washington when uh, the IEEE uh, got together with the UN Foundation. And what we did is we invited 
the technical people with IEEE who is trying to solve these humanitarian problems with the humanitarian organizations. It was an interesting uh, uh, experience, but uh, let me let me carry on. So basically, IEEE, for the benefit of everyone, it's about 450,000 members. Uh, it's the largest professional membership organization in the world. I'm a member of IEEE, but also IEEE Canada and Section 7, which is the Toronto chapter. So we're broken into chapters around the world. And the fastest growing uh, chapters are actually in India and a, uh, China. So uh, let, let me emphasize our model. It's advancing technology for humanity. Uh, and as I alluded to a little while ago, we came together over 10 years ago and it was called the IEEE Humanitarian Technology Challenge. And we started this process and I was part of one committee on the electrification issue coming up with a prototype. And what we did is we, our first project was in Haiti and it was in consultation with the, the local community and it was called Serona Care Solar Trailer. And that has branched off to many other locations. So again, uh, just, just to emphasize what our interest was is we saw the entire set of uh, sustainable development goals and we said, what can we tackle? And we boiled it down to three things, electrical connectivity, uh, which was a prototype of one kilo, kilo, uh, kilo, uh, kilowatt uh, system, uh, community connectivity projects, and individual slash uh, patient records. So we, at the core of our project, we were um, looking at that magic that happens when you have proper community consultation, local partnerships, local control and ownership. And that really gets an essence at the heart of what uh, human rights are. So again, the core principle of the IEEE Smart Villages is the dignity of our local partners and community, who one control, who own, not one, own, control, and work in the partnerships with the volunteers of IEEE. And there are local partners uh, with the local chapters that in sections that we have. And in, in essence, what we first started with is providing local power, these small scale, uh, off the grid electrical solutions provide critical first step in empowering the community to enable them to more, uh, to enable them to have internet connectivity. If you do not have power, uh, obviously you're not gonna have connectivity. So that, that's in essence the first step in the process. And what's very important as, as you all know, the cost of, of charging a cell phone is extremely expensive in many parts of the world. So having be able to access uh, an ability to charge your cell phone at a low price from your local provider is critical. And also the, the power that's provided is um, in some cases to create computer labs and obviously leading to uh, computer service. So very quickly, eight to 87 projects, 18 countries. And uh, we're, we're constantly improving the system. It's not like it came off the shelf, it has to adapt. Uh, we had to look at ways of dealing with uh, many issues, uh, in, including terms of having the, the batteries uh, sustain itself with, uh, in, in terms of the heat situation. Uh, we had to deal with local challenges uh, and, and this is fundamental as theft or people destroying the, the equipment and, and having the, the right network of, and the right partners. Sometimes they're not the right partners at the beginning. So um, one of the interesting projects uh, uh, associate who actually started this project in Galapagos Islands, he started an intranet and again, it started with power, uh, but it, it has branched off into uh, um, a program that benefit ecotourism as well. It's a local project that is providing internet access in, in the community. Without this uh, funding support, this would have not happened. Um, I want to just mention that this is not just an organization that's dictated, it, it funnels down to the many societies that exist within uh, IEEE, uh, as you can see from PES all the way to the Reliability Society. Uh, there's many subcommittees that, as well, uh, but it is a combination of not only the, the, the main organization supporting this, but it's also bottom-up uh, volunteers, students who are getting involved in local projects. So I just wanted to share with you some very quick links uh, that you can contact, uh, uh, get more details on the projects that are, are working away, contact the people 
with the leads on them. And if you want to get more information about Smart Villages, please contact Mike Wilson. I uh, supplied the email there. Okay, that's it. Very quick. Thank you, Glenn. Um, in the context of IEEE, I think it's also worth mentioning the Connecting the Unconnected Challenge, which IEEE launched last year. Um, for example, our friends from Alter Mundi won the uh, Community Enablement category this year. Um, last year, Sarbani's project on bamboo towers also won in the Technical Concept category. Um, so it's great to see that community networks are also being increasingly recognized as complementary access solutions, even by these very technical bodies, such as the IEEE. Um, but yeah, now back to the human rights aspect. Um, our next speaker is Nielsen Over, who is a principal investigator at the Critical Infrastructure Lab and postdoctoral researcher at the University of Amsterdam. Um, his research is about um, how norms such as human rights get inscribed and subverted in communication infrastructures through their transnational governance. Um, over to you, Niels. Thanks so much, Senka, and uh, actually this whole dynamic coalition for continuing the important work. For instance, the work on the uh, previous uh, community network books that really helps us think through uh, internet networks. Many of us think that the internet started with um, devices like these. The PDP-11, oh, let me quickly flick off that background so that some of the devices I have here can... Uh, actually be seen here. No background. Let's see if it works. Yes. Here we got a model of the PDP-11, which was one of the biggest, which was one of the computers that was first interconnected via the internet. But if we think a bit longer about networks, then we know that actually early connect networks connected via devices like this. And then relatively quickly, it developed to laptops, mobile phones, but actually now many devices in the world, the majority more look like this or even smaller sensors that are connected. And this brings us to questions that were already asked in the McBride report or the many voices one world that asked who owns actually the means of production and the means of communication. So who can also control the content and the discussions that are held over that. And then since I really like the comment made by Sarbani that uh, uh, interconnectivity, but also the lack thereof, is playing a more important role in the development of new networks. And as uh, 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 Rita Zajatz already uh, shows in her discussion of uh, telegraph networks, is that connectivity and discon uh, disconnectivity is actually not a radical shift, but is a continuous spectrum that is explored in trans transcontinental networks. And what we're currently seeing with uh, filtering going on in China and Russia, but also in Europe, the data localization laws, and also the practice seeing that in community, uh, uh, community networks is actually an exploring of power differentials within the network. Because as Laura Denardis uh, tells us that we have the internet and everything, and it becomes a network without off switch. So if we can't switch off the end devices, then the control position might indeed be in the network as it was before the internet when it were still telecommunications networks. And what is the problem is that it's actually been the user that has been excommunicated from the network. And owning and operating these networks by ourselves might actually provide more control to users. But as the speaker from Alter Mundi said, Operating these networks takes a lot of money, knowledge, and expertise. And that might actually be offloading something on citizens that they not have the capacity or the sustainability to sustain such a complex infrastructure. So the question is, do new technologies such as private 5G networks actually offer cheaper technology and cheaper manners of configuration to deploy new networks? So for over a decade, people running community networks have asked for spectrum allocation, but now with the alignment of the interests of network operators, equipment providers, and even service providers in the proliferation of private 5G networks, you see that the interests are colliding and possi possibly you, we do not need to emulate telco networks, but can run much smaller networks via microcells 
with cheaper networks uh, 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 through because the more modularization of telecommunication networks. So I think whereas the internet for a long time was the newest kit on the block and was giving us all these possibilities through Wi-Fi, etc. We're now seeing that the internet is kind of starting to show its age. So if we want to look like the to the future, we might need to look like the look at the past of telecommunication networks and how we can uh, ingrain more control in them, but also provide more configuration possibilities for users without having them very hard to operate. Luckily, we're seeing that increasingly networks are running themselves and uh, hopefully will take away both uh, 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 time and resources for communities that they need to run these networks, but also might provide possibilities of ownership and configurability to these communities with this new iteration of uh, telecommunication infrastructures. But that only works if we manage to include the voice and the needs of the end users in the design of these new communication imaginaries. And for that, uh, opportunities such as this in the IGF are extremely important. So I'm really happy for uh, the organization of this forum and its possibility to talk about it. Thanks so much. Thank you very much, Niels. And now uh, we are we are have our last two panelists, uh, Carla and Jane. So first we go to uh, Carla Beldencio, who works with uh, Rizomatica and also has been uh, working with us in this coalition for a lot of years. And so please, Carla, the floor is yours. Thank you so much for the invitation. I'm so happy to be here. And I think everyone has talked uh, about really interesting points and I do not want to be repetitive about these policy issues that we need to change. But I want to start thinking about like some of the narratives that we are uh, talking about when we talk about uh, community networks and also when we talk about this relationship between access and human rights. At this point, I think we need to step back a little bit and to think uh, really well about these narratives behind the goal of connecting humanity <coughs> to enable human rights. First, uh, I think we, we always, as always assume that connectivity is always, always preferable to disconnection. And this can lead to uh, really harmful uh, assumptions because different means of achieving this connectivity seems to not matter at all. And so we are always thinking that the goal of access, what, like, once that the goal of access is reached, we need to to do something else. But as Nick, as Nicolas Echanis was saying, like different ways of connecting people has different impact on how they can uh, exercise their human rights. So actually, community networks shouldn't be like seen as something complementary, but something different that can enable different ways of protecting human rights, uh, which are not achieved with other kind of community connectivity, as, as, as you were saying, like when we have these neutrality issues or problems with data protection or surveillance, right? So I think um, in this narrative, when connectivity is perceived as an end unto itself, rather than a facilitator or other to other more important things, we have a problem. We usually forget that connectivity should be this enable, uh, enabler for human rights, which means that access should not be reached by any means and without thinking of the consequence. And this leads me to another false narrative that we usually have, or we usually repeat in this kind of, of panels that is like um, being accessed something that we need to achieve. It's equally desired for everyone and it will necessarily lead to something good. Actually the very 
classification of unconnected or uh, this disconnected people uh, tells us uh, quite a bit. There are a lot of examples that these people are completely different. We are referring actually to nearly the half of the world's population. And we don't usually talk about these different geographies, cultures, and day-to-day -day realities. Among those billion people, of course, there are many who want to be connected, but they are not uh, an homogeneous group of people. And we need to take this into account. And I think community networks has that potential that they can, well, this, this kind of networks can actually uh, work with these communities and with their differences and with their local realities, which is something really, really important when we talk about this, uh, like to end with the digital gap. And also, I think we, uh, in this, in this kind of trying to challenge the, the narratives, we need to start thinking and gets like to step back and think also the uh, like the multiple hazards or risk that we face with connectivity and like we as connected people and that we are talking here we have of course uh, enormous benefits but also we are fa facing a lot of, of risk uh, at the internet, for example, surveillance, data protection, privacy, a lot of these uh, human rights that could be uh, harmed when we go online. So I think we really need to start uh, talking more about this risk and how we will manage them. Uh, their reality today, and everyone has, has said it, is like that a few companies owns the upper and the lower layers of the internet. And we have really like an unprecedented centralization of power and control. And it's also true, not only for the companies, but also that governments around the world are using these digital communications to monitor and surveillance their people. So when we talk about connectivity and access, we need to be uh, prepared to face this risk. And we need to find different models that are like more suitable to be facing this risk. And I think uh, it's really important to start thinking com connectivity as which models can really be beneficial for human rights because we have some models that are not so access is shouldn't be the end uh, unto itself but we need to find which kind of access is really important for enabling these human rights so i hope i stick in the time thank you Thank you, Carla. Thank you for this interesting insight on, uh, let's say, the right to disconnect. Um, we have 10 minutes left. Um, our last speaker is Jane Coffin. Um, I think Jane could give some, uh, well, I will leave the concluding remarks to Luca, but uh, maybe if Jane can wrap up the session in like five minutes. Thank you so much. <laughs> Absolutely, and um, what a great panel, and I'm, I'm very honored to be here today. Um, hello to many colleagues and friends. Um, and I wanna give a shout out to Anatel, of course, and to um, the Mexican government, the Kenyan government, and others that are looking at creating better regulatory frameworks that include community networks. Um, so thank you, Ronaldo, for all the work you're doing, and others um, that we know, like Roberto, too, who's in the um, ITU context. Um, and starting with that, from the governmental perspective, it really is a multi-stakeholder approach that's going to get us to having more networks of diverse sizes and diverse types. And so we've seen that the current market uh, solutions that many people believe will solve all of our connectivity problems have not. Um, I do a lot of work around the world and doing a lot of work right now in the United States, and I can tell you the market is not solving our connectivity problem. I don't want to be negative. I just want to say that this means that we need to bring in alternative 
ways of looking at um, community networks as key partners in the connectivity space and municipal networks and other types of locally owned, operated, and managed networks. That means we're going to have to take a look and take care, as uh, Sarbani, Raquel, and others, and Carla have said, that take great care with how we, we bring in connectivity in certain communities, whether they want it or not, how the content is um, brought in, and how the communities can be impacted by it is very important. But we do need to look at different regulatory models, as um, Ronaldo pointed out, but also Adriana, um, with respect to spectrum, universal service, licensing, and financing. These are different types of markets that we're looking at. A local access network in a local uh, community, some say last mile, those last mile networks, if they're community or municipal networks, are very different. They're going to be community-led, cheaper equipment. Glenn brought in some different um, models that the IEEE is working on and you in different ways of working and managing and governing those and more accountability to the local community in those models so you wouldn't take the same approach to the current um, market that the bigger telcos have as that you would for the community networks and particularly on the financing side and there's a panel tomorrow on this early on the financing of community and last mile networks it's very important to think of deconstructing the current models that are used for financing community networks, I mean, sorry, uh, big networks, and deconstructing that for um, community networks and municipal networks so that there's access to capital. Um, um, Nico had mentioned that there's the very important uh, point about alternative, the word alternative and additional, it came to my mind when you're talking about community networks, he's right. And the more we look at this and the more we pull apart the impact of community-led networks, the fact that they can work closely in local communities, they can also work with middle mile networks, they're working with local governments, they're working with a variety of community um, led organizations also, so the APC types and the Internet Society, Connect Humanity, my organization now, it really does take a different approach to building out more connectivity because as I've said, the market and the current regulatory regimes haven't solved all those problems. It's very important to take a look at that. Um, and Adriana, who's on this panel as well, has seen this very much in Mexico where the social purpose licensing came in and uh, organizations like Raiza Marica have been doing work with the Mexican government. And I'm hearing that Kenya has opened up their licensing regime and brought in community networks and is looking at universal service funding. So I want to just say as a sort of a wrap up, we have made immense progress. And thank you to Luca and Nico Ashanis um, for having created the DC3 with this huge community, because you have made a big difference through the IGF process in influencing government, working with um, the some of the private sector, working with the um, the civil society and other organizations promoting human rights because we're talking about inclusion and digital equity and digital inclusion and community led networks owned and operated um, whether you're calling them community connectivity providers community networks municipal networks whatever they are these are changing the way we look at inclusion connectivity and it's really helping us change the game and that means everything from the regulatory policy side to how we finance and how we bring in more inclusion. Um, I'm going to stop speaking right now so that we can, uh, so Luca can wrap up. But I think it's really important, and I didn't want to leave out Nils for the great work he's doing on human rights to move things forward from the technical space because we do have to work with the internet community. And as the internet is a network of networks, um, those networks of networks have different governance models. They're not all going to be the same. So that means that we're going to have to find um, some unique and boutique solutions um, through our work with community and municipal uh, type networks. So thank you very much. Um, this was uh, really interesting to listen to and to hear all these different perspectives. But let's go forward from, uh, I guess, if there's a recommendation I could throw out, let's be creative when we're looking at the regulatory policy financing options. And alternative networks are a good thing. They are complementary, but they are also very important because they're different. Thank you very much. All right, we are uh, almost at the end of our time. And also thank you very much to Carla and Jane for having provided, uh, having been explicitly and specifically on time, not only for having provided very good uh, inputs and comments to the discussion, but also for having respected the time. We still have actually four minutes. 
So <clears throat> if we have any comments or uh, final question or final remarks, I see that uh, uh, here we have some comments in the chat. It's more about uh, a lot of food for thought that we have. Uh, I think that uh, as we do not have any explicit question in the chat, and I guess not even from the floor at the IGF, uh, it may be already time to wrap up as we only have uh, two minutes left in, in this morning, in this moment. Uh, so I, I would really uh, like to stress uh, a couple of key elements that emerge from the discussion of today. Uh, first, there is, although we have been working a lot and we, ha we have been quite successful over the past uh, eight years, we still have a lot to do. Uh, there is still a lot of work that can be done uh, to uh, make uh, this initiative more visible, to make also to, to, to st stimulate a, a change in paradigm. Uh, considering connectivity, when we speak about connectivity as an enabler of human rights, really uh, giving concrete example of what this means in practice. I really like what Carla was mentioning that uh, many of the models of connectivity we have, they may not correspond to this logic and it's, it is uh, essential to be critical and objective about this. I really like what uh, uh, Jane was mentioning about the, the need also to uh, understand the limits of the uh, traditional mainstream models we have. And we have been writing a lot about this. Uh, I myself, one of the first uh, thing that I, I say to students when I speak about community network is that uh, if there are, uh, if there is a, a, a technical definition of market failure areas is because the market fails to connect specific type of areas where there is no return on investment. And so to, uh, if we want people living in those areas to be uh, uh, the protagonist of their digital uh, evolution, the protagonist of connectivity, to allow those people to have more opportunity in life, to enjoy a right to work, a, route, a right to co communication, uh, to have better privacy, again, that is a point that is severely under-evaluated, uh, but the fact that we are switching towards models where connectivity uh, services, even hardware, is paid with collection, indiscriminate collection of, of personal data, uh, rather than with money, uh, that is something that can create enormous negative externalities and enormous distortion on how our societies is are, 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 uh, are governed and, and, and the kind of sustainability that we have, not only at the level of connectivity, but at the social level. So I think there are, we have still a lot of work uh, to do and uh, luckily a lot of people here uh, are very happy to work a lot and to do a lot of uh, nice projects together. So I would like to uh, thank uh, a lot all the participants and also especially uh, my co-moderator Senka for the excellent work with yet another excellent uh, session. We have shared already the uh, link to the this year reports on community networks as enablers of human rights. It is also, of course, available on the DC3 page uh, of the IGF website and will be soon available also on the uh, DC3 website, comconnectivity.org. Thank you very much to everyone and have an excellent IGF 2022. Ciao, ciao. See you next year.